Hey, I'm Fred. And I'm Ed. And when this I'm is Create a Mike, Generation. Create a Generation of Hype. All right, Frederico, what is happening this week? This week we're chatting to James from the channel Sweeney, which is all about history and it's all animated. I would suggest to anyone who ever becomes self-employed, set yourself a schedule and do your best not to deviate from it. I know, Ant, you're a, a big fan of history and you're a big fan of this channel. Love history. Love this channel. We don't nerd out about history in this podcast, though, so don't freak out. We talk about YouTube creating and growing channels and interesting stuff like that. Frederico, before we get started, we've been working really hard in the background on our own online course called Change a College. The online college just for content creators. Check it out at changeacollege.com. That's C-H-A-N-G-E-R, college. Com. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. We are joined today by James from the YouTube channel, which I will pronounce incredibly wrong. <laughs> Fribner. Sweeney. Yeah, Sweeney. <laughs> Sweeney. It's just Sweeney. That was pretty good. I've heard all manner of different pronunciations. So, I think when I first met you, like you, you had to say it like five times, and yeah. I, I, I got to the point where I was like, "Oh yeah, of course." And then it's yeah. like I went and checked it out, and I was like, "Ah." Oh, I know yep. this channel, but I never, I don't think you say it. I think uh, the idea with it was that I wanted something that was recognizable, at least, so people could say, oh, yeah, the channel with the weird spelling, you know, got to make yourself stand out somehow. Really? So, like, have you got a connection to the name? Yeah, it's actually my um, last name. We were talking about my last name earlier, but, yeah, it's my last name. So um, it's a Gaelic word. It's pronounced... In Gaelic, it's pronounced uh, Sivna, but, you know, so I get a lot of um, comments on my videos from angry Irishmen telling me that I'm pronouncing my own name incorrectly. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so I it, it was when it was um, moved over to England, the English couldn't say Irish names very well, so they just said Sweeney, and that pronunciation is stuck. Wow, they went a little way away from it. Because I, yeah. um, I I couldn't help myself, but I looked up like a whole bunch of audio like pronunciations for it. And man, there's yeah. some weird, weird, weird things mm-hmm. going on. Like, and I'm like <laughs> what is going on? Yeah, uh, it's not great if you pronounce it phonetically. Yeah, it's good fun. But what's your channel about? Like, we know, now everyone knows the name, but like maybe you can tell us a bit about what the channel is. Sure. So it's sort of morphed and grown a little bit over the years. Um, what I do is I cover history broadly of nation states. So the idea was that, you know, there's, there's a lot of great history content out there. There's a lot of great history about different topics that people know, like stuff you'd learn in school, you know, the French revolution, the American revolution, you know, big, big chunks of history that you can condense down into a topic, but there wasn't, great content for just overarching start to finish how did this country come to be and a number of years ago i was watching a channel called geography now and was very inspired by him so he was this guy that i used to i used to watch him even before he started his current channel that he has which is very successful wildly successful and um he used to do languages like he would just set himself a goal and try and learn a new language and try and learn a full sentence in that language. And um, he was great. I just loved watching him because he would always just record from his from his house or wherever he was traveling. And I loved how raw it was and how he managed to really pull off learning some pretty difficult languages. Like one of his big ones was trying to learn Greenlandic. And I was like, this guy is insane. Like, what, what are you trying to do learning Greenlandic? And it turns out he his name is Paul. He had this big passion for geography and for cultures and languages and things like that so he started like looking for content on youtube about you know what's the what's the geography and the demographics and the political geography of greenland and what's the um you know what's their diplomacy like things like that and then he found out that there's nothing on youtube like that so he decided he was just going to start his own channel and cover every country from a to b what's their geography you know um what sort of diplomatic relationships do they have with other countries? What are their people made out of? Uh, what are their cultures made out of? What are their languages made out of? Things like that. And I was watching this channel and I was like immediately just struck with this idea to do the same thing, but with history. 
and I started my own channel and um, it was kind of just a hobby for a while. So I was just covering sort of like people who've been around on my channel for a long time. I did the sort of things where I like, oh, Alexander the Great, you know, I'm going to cover Alexander the Great. I did some Game of Thrones videos as well. And uh, eventually I found my niche, which was just sticking to that, doing a country from start to finish. And um, it took off from there. It's not a it's not a small thing to uh, take on the uh, telling of the history of an entire country. Yeah, <laughs> um, no, it's pretty, definitely pretty, not. <laughs> it's pretty ambitious. Um, but you also um, it's animated too, right? Like these are animated yeah. history. Yeah. So at the beginning, <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. So I downloaded <laughs> um, Sony Vegas um, awesome. off the internet and. I watched a couple of tutorials on how to use it and quickly, like I, I knew a few things about Photoshop and I knew a few things about Adobe Illustrator and things like that. So I just sort of um, managed to sort of fudge my way through it. And I created these videos and I was just like, these suck, but like they were a lot more impressive than what I could have created if, for example, I was doing it in high school. I remember I, I used to do multimedia in high school and the videos we produced were just awful and I was so proud of myself I was like oh man look how far I've come look how high I've risen I've created these really really awful videos that are not public at all anymore on my channel <laughs> and then um, one day I just sat down I remember exactly where I was I was in I was in Macca's so for international people I was in McDonald's <laughs> and I was on my laptop just sort of having a look at my channel and thinking, oh, what's in the news today? And, um, you know, Scotland was in the news because they just recently had an independence referendum and Brexit had just happened, like the vote for Brexit had just happened. So I was like, oh, you know, like Scotland, that's a pretty cool thing that not many people know about. I'm going to do a history on Scotland. And I did, and it was awful. But that, <laughs> that got like 40,000 views in a couple of days. And I was like, okay, like, what is this? how did this happen? Um, and I earned like a good $30, $40 from that. And I was just like, man, it's payday. It's absolute payday. <laughs> That's a lot of big max, yeah. right? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot I, of big max. I, I want to get more into the animation in, in a while, but first I want to just ask, like, are you like a history buff through and through? Is that something you've always been super interested in? If my year seven history teacher knew what I did now, she'd be very surprised. <laughs> Uh, so I remember I, I got to, she was, you know, I love her now, but you know, I hated her then. <laughs> she was like my least favorite teacher and I just sucked at everything. She taught history and geography and I couldn't, couldn't stand those subjects because I couldn't stand the teacher. And then one day, one day, like, um, I was, I was born in South Africa and we just learned about South African history in my, in my class. And one day we got to World War One and World War Two, and I saw like a massive blown up photo um, on a projector of a atomic bomb. And I was just like awestruck. And I was like, what is this? And how do I learn more about it? And from then on, like this installation of history was in me, but I sucked at the subject. Like I really didn't do well at all. But from then on, my my interest in history and other cultures and and countries in general and just traveling and things like that that's when it really started right i think um answer history i mean he did i think a degree in uh witchcraft and wizardry or something like that and um <laughs> waiting for so this he's, he's got he's got a he's got a natural not a interest in not a degree history. in witchcraft and wizardry it was one subject <laughs> in witchcraft and wizardry Witchcraft and demonology. Come on. Oh it's, my goodness. It's a real thing. Witchcraft and demonology. It, I, okay. Yes, I you know, I am a I am a history history buff. I, I you know, look, I, I have a degree in history and ancient history. They've been very, very useful in my career. Um I can't tell if we're joking at the moment. No, 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 I genuinely this is have real. those pieces of paper, okay. but I have never real. used them other than um for some Good critical thinking and yeah. uh, watching your YouTube channels, maybe. Um, yeah. But well, yes, there was craft don't... and demonology, and it was a very, very good subject. Um, don't knock it till you try it. Look, no. <laughs> trust me, it was great. It was very good. But yes, 
every you know everyone should be i, I think everyone should have a, a you know some grounding in understanding the history of where we've come from yeah, I think yeah. It's very important. And they're very popular channel uh, history channels um on youtube are mm-hmm. very popular um and um like also the way that you know there's so many people doing it but only very few people have managed to rise to the top given you know it's about the the way you do it and how you tell the stories and how you take apart things that are very complex sometimes and have a lot of facts yeah. and just, you know, streamline them down. So obviously you were a fan, obviously you, that you said that, that fan of, uh, became a fan of history mm-hmm. from there and it, and it grew. So how did it grow from there to where you, were, where you are now then? Well, I pretty soon realized that um, it was going to be, vi- it was sort of not viable, but it had potential. And I remember discussing it, you know, sort of with people around me and thinking like, what the heck is this? How do I, do something with it. And from from then on, it sort of just remained a hobby. I made a couple of videos and they didn't do nearly as well. And then I made a video on the history of Germany and that basically kickstarted my uh, current career. I think the reason why is a little embarrassing. I got laid off from my job and I was just kind of in a bad place and I was kind of depressed and didn't really know what to do. So I had a whole lot of time on my hands and I just decided, you know, either I can spend time looking for a new job or I can just spend all my free time on this because I was a full-time university student as well. I was in my, I think, second year or third year and I didn't really know I, I was just in the wrong headspace to try and look for another job. So I came home and I sat down and I learned After Effects, basically, mm-hmm. and put together my History of Germany video. And it basically, that video was wildly successful. It, it kick-started my YouTube career. And it was just that kick-start that I needed, you know, that kick up the ass that I needed to just have all this free time on my hands and be in a really sort of down mood and thinking how unfair the world was to me you know it was just a you know, typical young guy and and thinking that oh the world's so unfair how come bad things have only happened to me and i just took all that energy and put it into making this video which i was proud of and gave me something to do and it and it was and it was great it was one of the best feelings of success i've had so far during a really difficult period in my life uh, and um yeah, from then on, it just grew. I think that's actually really great advice, especially what's happening now around in the world where a lot of people, you know, they have lost their jobs and a lot of them are wondering what to do. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's, would you have any advice for people like that in terms of sort of where they are right now? I think if there's something that you've been meaning to do, creatively especially, it's, it's time to do it when you've got the time to do it. You know, you, you can procrastinate and put things off, but, what, end, what ends up happening is that you sort of obsess over the idea of, action, of, of the thing rather than doing the thing. Mm. And that can be destructive to your creative process and also just to your life in general. Um, you know, I'm by no means an expert. I managed to find a little bit of success with a massive amount of luck, but, you know, that opportunity wouldn't have been given to me if I didn't actually do it. I think you'll find the same thing from other creators. They just sort of fell into it almost. Like nobody sets out to be a creator. Nobody sets out to be like, okay, this is going to be my full-time job. I'm going to aim for this. But you just kind of start doing something and eventually one day you find your audience. And if, you're, if, you're, if your stuff is good, you'll find that audience. One of my um, philosophies is that everyone has their audience. No matter how weird your niche is, no matter how sort of isolated you feel within your own interests or community. If you make good things, people will watch it. There is an audience out there for literally everyone. The amount of work it takes might differ, but everybody can find that audience, especially on a creative platform like YouTube. That is so right. I can't agree more with that. And (laughs) there's always weird and wonderful things that you would never have thought of that exist that people are interested in, right? Like. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there might be only 10, 20 or, or less per city in the world, but that's a lot of people. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it adds up. It, it's, uh, yeah, whether that's witchcraft and demonology <laughs> or history or like... Yeah. You know, or, or wizardry and witchcraft. Wizardry, you know. I, I, <laughs> you know, I think the, the wizardry people might be 
thinking they shouldn't be lumped together and that's what's interesting <laughs> yeah. too and there's people who are like no we're not part of that niche and that's the passion yeah. right that's the passion you talk and the people you're talking about right james like yeah exactly it's just got to be the passion that drives you to create something good and if you can create something good um there's a lot of people out there who are starved for that, that kind of content there's a lot of people out there if you're in a specific niche i mean before you know um mukbangs were a thing on youtube you know can you imagine the amount of people who didn't realize how much they loved it and just love to sit down and watch people eat you know it's like it may not be something that you can understand if you're not into it but as soon as you see people doing it you're like oh yeah no i didn't realize i wanted to watch this and now i'm going to watch this it's the same with asmr like where the heck did that come from <laughs> and yet it's so popular you're just like this is the weirdest thing and yet it's so it's got such a big audience it's it's people finding things that they're interested in out of nowhere rather than just being fed like okay what whatever's on tv tonight no i can i can watch somebody brush a microphone <laughs> <laughs> or eat a donut yeah it's weird yeah yeah if you were, yeah if like i don't know how long asmr has been around but if you were to describe that say three four years ago and say this is things going to blow up or mm -hmm. um, or whatever and you described what it is mm -hmm. I, no one would say yeah, no man, let's go do that other than no that. way <laughs> which is awesome it is right? so yeah like it is say, it really is People say, oh, you can't find an audience on YouTube. I think I, lo I love what you said. Like everyone has their audience. Um, Everybody, yeah. And it just might not be as big or it might take more work. I re like, I love that. Like, it's, yeah. um, that's really cool. That's a it's like if you, if you, for example, were really, really into figurine painting, like you, that was your whole life. That was your gambit. Like you really love that. Imagine like how starved you are for content <laughs> in the real world. You know, there's nothing on TV about figurine painting other than maybe some 15 minute BBC documentary between two episodes of a really popular show. You know, you're not going to get anything like that. But now there's like massive communities of figurine painting people who just that's all they do. That's that's what they love and that's what they watch. Like you can find that audience out there because there's people out there who want to see what you want to what you make. It's a beautiful thing. So I just want to quickly just talk about your process. I mean, we've talked to quite a few animators um, um, over our time at Creative Generation and, you know, the work we do generally in the creative community. Um, and it is a very difficult area because it's so time consuming. Um, yeah. Can you, I mean, not only that, but you're now also combining that with, you know, these with history and having to tell a complicated story in a, in a, in a short amount mm -hmm. of time. Can you tell us about how that process works and, and you know, the intricacies of that? Yeah, so animation is... I don't know. It's a beast, man. It's like, why did I ever pick this? I always loved, I always loved drawing. Like when I was a kid, I loved to draw things, um, painting. I went to like art classes and did art at school and things like that. So it's always been an interest of mine. And I think I just needed some sort of creative outlet as well. So I decided, you know, I'm not going to use stock footage to tell my stories. I'm going to try and animate it. <laughs> and it takes forever. So I draw everything in, uh, Illustrator and Photoshop, and then I'll animate it in a program called After Effects, which many animators know. And it results in about like if I'm really pushing it, it's it's ten minutes of video per one month of work, and that is just this all-consuming beast. And I think it's it's both a good thing and a bad thing because people can recognize something that looks good. But at the same time, you also, you don't get to see the finished product until you've already worked for a month. So there's no way you can like go back and do be like, oh no, I need to change that. Or I need to cut that out. Like if you edit together some clips that you shot on video, you can pretty quickly see if something's not working or something's not gelling or the music's not right, or that needs to go be a reshot or whatever. You, you, you can pretty quickly see that after you edit it for a few days. Whereas with, with animation, it's like once it's in, it's set in stone. Like if you don't want to give yourself an extra few weeks of work, you can't change anything. And it's its its own beast. It is um, very time consuming. And by the time I put a video out, I never want to watch it again. <laughs> I remember um, we had Mars from the uh, Marsing, who's another mm -hmm. animator on the show. And he, he was also saying like, you know, the same thing. Animation takes a long, long time, obviously. Um, 
and it, it's great to hear you say so clearly 10 minutes of uh, of animation is there's there's a month of yeah. work um he also sort of highlighted the the problem the challenge with youtube is if you make a video that doesn't quite hit the mark it's another you know two months until mm -hmm. assuming your next video hits the mark until that mm -hmm. so do you do you have is does that weigh on you at all or do you like do you take that into account and... yeah it certainly does i think um with animation there's very little you can do to course correct if you think of like your YouTube channel as a ship that you need to steer, you, you know, if you if a channel's going in a direction that's just not working, it can take you forever to figure out why, because every video you put out, you're like, oh, what lessons do I need to learn from the previous one? It's, it's very unwieldy, but you, it, it is possible. You know, I don't want people to be deterred by that by thinking that it's not possible. Animation is, um, it's a fantastic medium. And I think, it's also a very rewarding medium because it's artistically rewarding. It's hard to put it into words. I think that when you do course correct your channel, it's also a very self fulfillment feeling as well. I don't quite know how to put it for a long time. My channel went through a bit of a dip and then I changed pretty much everything about my channel a few, like six months ago. And that's only benefited me. And that has not only made me feel better about the next video that I put out and the next video, but it also makes me feel better about the whole channel. And it makes me feel better about myself because I've learned like a really valuable lesson on the way to create videos. Yeah. So there's a different layers of like the way you're improving yourself in your art form. I think Fred's going to ask the exact same thing here. Fred, what you got a question. I was going to say, can you tell us what that dip was and then what the correction totally. was? Yeah. <laughs> like, dude, you yeah. got you to let us in on this. Yeah. yeah. So a little while ago, hmm. I don't even know. Time means nothing to me now. Um, <laughs> Nor do anyone else. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so back in the day, views were everything, and then it became about watch time. And I remember sitting, thinking about it, and I'm, a couple of videos were doing really, really well, and then a few videos were doing okay, but not that great. And then YouTube started shifting towards watch time. And I was still thinking, like, I'm burning myself out with every video I make. I was making five to seven minute videos, taking them weeks to make. And I was like, I, I need to put out more videos. I can't just sit around for a month and not make a video. I need to push out more content. And I was like, more content means more views, right? Like more is better <laughs> was my philosophy at the time. And this is probably, you know, probably a year and a half ago now. And I, I would just, work my butt off to try and get a new video out every single month. And if I missed a month, I would be, you know, distraught. I was like this, you know, um, this isn't working. My channel's going to fail. And the videos weren't, weren't doing very well. They were sort of getting up to a certain level and then nothing. So I was like, I'm just going to shorten the videos, make them shorter and more concise and leave out some of the bigger stuff and see if that works so that I can produce more. And if I can produce more, hopefully, the YouTube algorithm gods will <laughs> promote my content more. And it never happened. And I couldn't figure out why. And all my other creative friends were telling me, dude, stop making short videos, make longer videos. Because they get pushed by the algorithm more. I mean, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation here, but generally the, the algorithm does favor longer content. It favors keeping people around on the platform longer. And also I wasn't happy with my writing style. So I would sort of be like, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened, which is you know great if you're interested, but if you're not interested, it's not interesting to people who wouldn't have otherwise clicked on the video. So if you're from Denmark, for example, and you click a video on Denmark, you'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, that's great. You know, you got all the facts right. But I, I don't want my video to just be popular with people in Denmark. I want it to be popular with people who've been like, Oh, I've always wondered about that. You know, I've always wondered about how the Vikings became this tiny little country and, you know, that things like that. And I, I think I just had to overhaul my writing style to make it more entertaining. So I sat down and I took two months off basically, or a little bit longer than that, actually. And I took two months off, I sat down in, in my little room in my little writing cave and I covered myself in blankets and I said, what am I going to do? First, I'm going to scrap my time limits. So 
forget like keeping it under 10 minutes and I'm just going to make it as long as my fingers will allow me to type. If there's history in there, I want it to be covered. I want it to cover everything. And then I also try to make it more entertaining to try and keep people, people engaged because there's a bit of boring stuff in history. You know, history can be very boring, but there's also some fascinating things as well. Um, one of the best channels for that is a channel called um, Oversimplified. You know, he takes yeah. these topics that people, you know, have heard a million times. People know the story about World War One. They know the story about the French Revolution. But to hear it in his terms is, is it's funny. You know, it's interesting. It's engaging. And, um, and I needed that. I needed to be entertaining. So in my little writing cave, I came out with my script for um, my Japan video, which was uh, 25 minutes long, I think which was the longest video I'd ever done. And it took me, you know, just forever to animate. And that kick-started my second growth in my channel. And ever since then, I've been creating longer videos, just taking my time with them rather than setting myself these arbitrary deadlines or these arbitrary um, time limits and things like that. And that has worked wonders. And I just wish that I'd listened to those people who told me earlier to just make longer content and don't worry about how long it takes because overall it's better for your channel and it's better for your audience too. And it's more intellectually honest. Mm. You know, you don't want to just say this happened then this happened and this, is, this happened. You just want to, you want to really get to down to the details and figure out why things happened, not just when they happened. It's actually a really fascinating area because, um, like you were saying, it, it seems like the algorithms do favor longer form content, but I think you're right in the fact that the reason they favor them is that audiences like sticking around um, and watching longer form content um, on YouTube, and obviously that means they're on the platform longer. Um, mm -hmm. And it's become really popular. I mean, we work with a creator called uh, Internet Historian, um, and some of his content is now pushing, you know, um, <laughs> upwards of an hour. So it's some, but like the thing is, they're, they're very engaging videos, and you know, have yeah. extremely good retention. But people love watching it, and then you obviously watch that, and you go back and watch more, and you, you, next thing you know, you've watched you know three or four videos, and you've spent half a day on on in in the channel. But um, it's amazing how popular that long form within YouTube has become uh, because mm -hmm. people like spending so much time, um, you know, l listening to what they love, right? So, mm -hmm. and it's the whole thing. You, you, you have a passion for the history bit and the people who listen to you mm -hmm. have, have that passion for it too. And can you tell us though about the, about the people who are, who are passionate about you, your content, your audience and um, the group around you? Yeah, so the history community kind of all blew up all at once really. I think for a long time it was larger creators like um crash course that sort of dominated the history on youtube and then all of a sudden just around the time my channel came out also a bunch of others came out and you kind of you kind of need to stand out among people because you know you're not going to just watch the same battle on 12 different channels and see how they do it differently so i knew for one thing, I didn't want my channel to be about battles. I didn't want it to be about sort of, you know, let's look at this battle between this army and this army because history is just so much more interesting to me than that, like just specific battles that took place. Like warfare is only a tiny fraction of what makes history. Um, and it it sort of dawned on me, okay, I was like, I'm, I'm not going to do this battle thing because, you know, the the market is saturated and, and I'm just not, my heart's not going to be in it. And then there's other channels that stick out because of the way they present the information. You know, they've got their own unique art style or um, they've got their own unique way of telling stories or their writing is really good. And mine had to be getting, getting to people who are really interested in geography and linguistics and anthropology and things like that and the way people move around and and who is what and where and where did the name of this come from you know i had to get that niche of people who were as curious about these things as i was and the way that i try to think of it is if i was trying to make a video for an audience of me <laughs> if there was a bunch of me's out there and they wanted to click on a video would they click on this video and would they find it enjoyable and that was very 
um, helpful in my creative process because my audience now are very, very dedicated. I've got, I've built slowly over time because, you know, it hasn't been the um, biggest channel, but like slowly over time, I've seen the regulars who come in and a lot of people will say, oh, you got this wrong. And other people will say, no, don't attack him. And they'll defend, they'll defend me for things. So I've got a, a lot of those like regulars coming in, which is nice. Um, I think the people out there that are watching my videos are people who really engage with like the same thing that I'm feeling in my head when I'm writing the videos. Mm. They're, they're feeling like there's, there's stuff for content finding out what, what happened from, you know, how did the French revolution become the modern day country of France? You know, cause, cause if you're in a, if you're in a history class, you sort of learn, okay, French revolution, World War One, World War Two, they surrendered, and then we have today. You know, like what? Wait, what about the stuff in between? Like, what, how did that? You know, so it's it's those people I wanted to to interact with, and it's those people who I wanted in my audience. And, how, and um, it's been going pretty well. So. And how loyal is that audience? I mean, it's uh, over three hundred thousand now in terms of subscribers. But like, mm -hmm. are they? Are there, is there a, a dedicated fan base who are really into the content and you see regularly? I think. I've gone through two periods of dedication. Uh, one that I'm in right now, who are pretty engaged, um, um, quite a few uh, supporters on Patreon, a bunch of people who DM me on Twitter and really tell me how much they like my content. Uh, quite popular with history teachers. History teachers love it. Um, I'm always getting messages from history teachers who are like, yeah, hey, I showed you stuff in my class and things like that, which is awesome. Um, the first dedication period was right at the beginning. People really liked the content and they were happy to see where it was going to go. Right in the middle, I think my audience took a little bit of a, a break from me where I think that they were sort of unhappy with the direction and they were unhappy with the style and they were saying, you know, just like do it better, please. <laughs> we really like this channel. Do it better. And um, they've become a lot more dedicated now over time, like since, since changing my writing style and things like that, I've, I've seen a lot, a lot better responses from people and, um, hopefully it'll continue that way. So, I mean, obviously is this your full-time job now? Um, yeah. in terms of what you do, but like, how has it evolved as a career for you and, um, and how hard has that been as, as a process? As mentioned before, I started the channel as a hobby while I was in uni and at uni I was studying physiotherapy. So this, this is a kind of a different direction. I basically put all my eggs in the basket once I thought that it was sustainable. And by the time that it could sort of pay for rent and have a little bit left over, I was like, okay, this, this might work. So I never became a physiotherapist. I, you know, I graduated from university, but I've never worked as a physiotherapist. Um, I just went full on into into YouTube and it and it's been it's been tough because being a full time shut in is difficult. You know, you gotta force yourself to get out there and um see the sun sometimes. You're, you're like, what's everyone complaining at the moment with coronavirus? <laughs> like, dude, I've been yeah. living like this for years. <laughs> yeah. And what really annoyed me was the fact that I couldn't walk to the shops and get some toilet paper <laughs> that, that was really the only effect that i had you're like living life normally other than the fact that other people's behavior is now impacted. yeah yeah um, can we That's talk amazing. about um, i mean it's gotten worse now because you can't leave the house for pretty much anything except groceries mm -hmm. so it's it, it has in, interfered with life um now for pretty much everyone but yeah this being a shut-in is um is Difficult because I think right at the beginning, when you first start working full time, you you become a little bit isolated and obsessed with your craft, and you, you don't want to leave it. You just want to keep creating, keep creating, keep creating. It's like a heroin rush every time you do it. And after a while, you start to burn yourself out. And I went through a couple of burnouts. Mm. Um, just periods of time when I was just I physically felt sick you know, when I was working, um, just because I was obsessing over it and kept making new videos and working longer hours and 
working until three o'clock in the morning and until I eventually couldn't keep my eyes open anymore and collapsing on the couch and then waking up the next day with my laptop still in my lap and continuing working, you know? Mm. So it's, it's been a tough process for sure. I think, I think I've nailed it now. I think I'm good at working from home now. Um, I would suggest to anyone who ever becomes self-employed, set yourself a schedule and do your best not to deviate from it. You know, set yourself an alarm or something, wake up every day at the same time and finish every day at the same time, introduce a little bit of normality into your cycle because that way madness lies is, <laughs> is the worst. Uh, look, those are actually really good tips. I mean, generally uh, for content creation, but especially um, at these times we're in right now. Um, can we yeah. just quickly ask, like, like um, in terms of revenue streams, people ask a lot about that. Um, and I've noticed, obviously, yeah. in your channel, you do a lot of things around merch um, as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but can you just tell us, like, how that basically works for you and, you know, what works for you, what doesn't? Yeah, so the initial phase of growing a channel, you... you become pretty reliant on AdSense. And for people who probably know, um, AdSense is when they run ads next to your videos. And for a while, that was pretty much my only source of income. Um, I had enough to pay for my rent and a little bit more on top for things like food and, um, and other expenses, but like just not that much. And the more successful your videos become, the more AdSense you'll earn. And I knew I needed another revenue stream to keep it going. So I signed up to uh, Patreon and that supplemented my income pretty well. And then eventually sponsors start sniffing around once you reach a certain level. And I think for any potential creator out there, sponsorships are gonna be the one that you need to take the biggest magnifying glass to. Don't always just assume that whoever's sponsoring your video is a good company. Just have a look at them, but even more importantly, look at who's trying to sell you them. Because if, if you, you, you'll get an email from some ad agency and they'll say, yeah, we want to give you um, a sponsorship for X company. You know, don't just think, oh, X company wants to be on my video. No, 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 that's not how it works. It's It's an ad agency that's trying to sell you to the company. And it's worth investigating those people. It's worth investigating the the ad companies because a lot of them um, do take advantage of smaller creators. So especially around that time, even if you think, okay, you're living paycheck to paycheck and a nice big bonus at the end of the month would be great. Sometimes it's worth turning down the sponsorship. In fact, most times it's worth turning it down. I think I don't even answer my emails anymore. I don't even answer my sponsorship emails anymore because so many of them are just the same people who've sniffed around a whole bunch of other times before. Um, try to try to work with some trusted brands that you know and services that you use um, so that you can appropriately recommend them. But for revenue streams, um, sponsorship is the number one for me. Um, it doesn't even come close to everything else that I make, I'd say a good, a good uh, 80% of my revenue comes from sponsors. So I think that they're some of the best ways to support your business. Some really good points there, James, but I just want to quickly to also touch on, then you, you mentioned Patreon, like, and you said that, that works quite well for you, but like, yep. what's like, we get a lot of people saying, I like, how can I use Patreon? Like, like, why would someone want to give me money through Patreon? How do you look at that in that exchange where someone pays you on Patreon? Is it a, is it a tip jar scenario? I know you've got um, your custom pins, so maybe like, yeah. Like mm-hmm. How do you how do you frame that up? In- so Patreon has this interesting duality, and I think it's struggled with its branding for a few years. But there's there's two camps of people with Patreon, there's the kind of people who just want to support you. Um, They just want to, you know, say, hey, I like your stuff, here you go, you know, like a tip jar. But the other camp of people are the kind of people who view it as an exchange. They say, well, look, I'm supporting you, but I'd like a little perk in return. 
And that is the hardest balance with Patreon is trying to match that. So you need to appeal to the kind of people who just want to give you um, some support monetarily and the people who want to have some sort of perk to show how dedicated they are to your channel. You know, if, they, if they want a t-shirt or something like that and they want to support you, they can do it that way. Um, I think Patreon is the best way to support yourself because nothing is more loyal than the people who watch you. Um, it's the, the kind of thing is like money comes and goes with advertising. It's, it's not predictable. It's not anything that can be, um, a viable source of income for a lot of people. But Patreon is, is where you need to convince your audience to say, Hey, look, I, I love doing this. You guys love watching me do this. Therefore to help me keep doing this, you can support me here. And I think engaging with your audience on a personal level is really the key to making Patreon successful because, you know, you, you could have an audience of people who, you know, could be lower on the socioeconomic ladder, but still want to give something, you know, it's great for them who just want to give a dollar and other people who are more generous and they want a better perk. It's great for that because it's got a tier system. So that's great. I think, yeah, you, you just seem to need to be honest with your audience and, try and figure out w why people are watching your content and trying to explain to them how, you know, you can't just sit around making videos all day if, if, if it's not financially viable for you. And I think audiences are usually pretty smart with that kind of stuff. They're usually pretty switched on. They, they know and they can see, you know, the, the benefits that doing that kind of thing has, hopefully anyway. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I think that's a really great point. Um, especially, yeah, as you, as you point out, that these fans of yours are, are incredibly valuable to you. Not, not you know, monetary, not just monetarily, but they, but also, you know, they are the reason you're doing this, and them being having a, a pipeline to be able to support you and you engage with them through something like Patreon um, is stable compared to yeah. ads. That's really interesting and, and great to hear. Um, hey James. Yes, we, we've like burned through our time with you really quickly. great. Well, it felt okay. like it's gone really quickly to me. <laughs> yeah, um, hey, um, one thing we like to wrap our most episodes up, we've broken the rules so sometimes, so I'm gonna mm -hmm. say most is um, for our guest creators to share their top tips. Top three tips, yeah. I think number one, absolute most importantly, is wake up wake up every day at the same time and try to do it early. It's very easy to fall into that pattern of waking up after 12 every day <laughs> and just working until you can't keep your eyes open anymore. I've done it. Every creator's done it. It's, it's just don't do it. Just set yourself. Trust me. You'll the, the benefits outweigh everything else. You get more hours out of the day. I know that sounds ridiculous, but you get more hours out of the day. Um, you, you, you'll sort of see yourself getting to a point in your production and you'll, you'll look at your watch or you'll look out the window and you go, oh man, I've got so much time left. I've got so much time left to work rather than that psychological feeling of like, okay, how long has the sun been down for and why am I still working? <laughs> that kind of thing. It's just wake up. Like your, your brain is so benefited from waking up early. And I'm saying that as a kind of guy who hates waking up early. Like it takes a lot of energy for me to do that. Um, tip number two would be, um, don't, don't be, don't be consistent in terms of the kind of content you create, take risks, like don't be afraid to stick to the same thing. Don't be too monotonous. Audiences love it. They love it. They love seeing you do something new. They're not like bands. So you don't say, Oh, he was better in the olden days, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Just take, take a risk. And if stuff doesn't work, your audience will let you know, and you can just, Try something else. Um, I think, you know, th it's easy to fall into that trap of thinking that you need to be consistent with everything, the kind of thing you do. Like, you know, people will get bored and, and things like that. So, I, I don't know. Saying, this, saying that from my high horse, you know, I don't, <laughs> don't know how well that'll land. Uh, tip number three. What's tip number three? I don't think I have a tip three. They're two pretty good ones. Mm. I'm not gonna lie. 
Um, well, okay. They work for me. Especially <laughs> wake up. Like, that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's like, it's so obvious. Yeah. <laughs> you got to say it. And yeah. yeah. And like, I love that you're not, you're like, oh, it's hard, but it's so yeah. worth it. It's so good. I'll to tell hear. you right now, it's the smallest thing you can do that gives you the best results. It's the exchange that you get from doing something like that is fantastic. Your, your brain is more productive at those hours of the day. You know, we've got thousands of years of agricultural history behind us that tells us that you know, wake up in the morning, do the, do the hard work. Yeah. Actually, look, those are great tips, but I think a very, very important question. Um, and I know you don't know us that well, um, but knowing <laughs> history, um, what character first and foremost does Ant remind you of from ancient history? If there was um, <laughs> Leif Erikson. Leif Eric, is that a Viking? That is a Viking that discovered North America. Oh, I'll take that. There you go. Yeah. You got that, that beard, long hair thing happening, Ant. That that could be. Mm. That could, yeah. yeah. He, something he something about it works. Scholarly man too, and <laughs> yeah. uh, very handsome. Ant, Ant's, a, Ant's a very tiny man though. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe he lived with <laughs> as well, but that's. that's <laughs> Erickson, uh, the Viking warrior yeah, scholar. Erickson, yeah. <laughs> no, I reckon. Nice. There you go. Cool. He obviously left and the uh, country went south much, much later. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, yeah. he was in Canada technically. So. Ah, and what about Frederico? What, what, it's, uh... Oh, it's a bit of a harder one. Sultan Mehmed II. Yeah. And what, what was his claim to fame? He was the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. There you go. Dang. Yeah. So <laughs> put yourself in a big onion hat. Google it afterwards. You won't be disappointed. That's put yourself like... in a big onion hat, and um, you got your next Halloween uh, costume. It's my favorite. That's like the, the favorite type of hat. at that time too. Like he was yeah. king. Yeah, big king uh, daddy. Yeah, nice. Mm-hmm. Ah, uh, I'm still. I, I'll take the Viking one any day. Uh, um, and and hey. and Ant in in the world of wizardry and witchcraft, which you're an expert in, does James remind you of anyone in particular in that area? Probably. It's okay. I'll let you think about that. For Probably a some while. demonic possession that uh, sort of filled your brain with wonderful historical facts. No, I don't. Oh um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, Bookworm. and then and then was purged by you know the Catholic Church somewhere in some very public display. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, the in poor the... victim of you, the host probably died. Oh dear. Uh, Inquisition. Inquisition. Yeah. I was inquisited. Yeah. <laughs> you survived. You... Yeah. <laughs> laughing and the well this form of me survived <laughs> yeah. uh, james uh, thank you so yeah. much for joining us today uh it's actually thank you for fantastic having tips me. and um yeah we'll chat to you soon cool thanks man.